Well, section three is a new portion. It's the same, same book of First Peter that we've been in. This is lesson 20 on how to conquer suffering. And these people that he was writing to are being persecuted for their faith, as we often will be in this world. But he says the answer is to live for righteousness, not for evil. This portion, chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, is to stand up for Christ and, yes, suffer occasionally for righteousness' sake, for doing good. Um, it's a new section that dealing with these persecuted believers and anyone who's undergoing persecution even today. And believers, people that are trusted Christ, that are living for Christ, that are telling people about Christ and, and living the Christian life the right way, the way God wants us to live, will have persecution. The Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, be ridiculed, be mocked, ignored, passed over, isolated, cut off, abused, beaten, imprisoned, and even murdered. All believers face and will, will face persecution to varying degrees, of course. Here's the question. How do we handle it? How do you bear up under it? How can we be assured that you'll stand up and be faithful? There's one way. Stand for Christ. This is the right way. No matter what the suffering, no matter how vicious it might seem, or how unfair it might seem, no, what was unfair was that Christ went to the cross, amen? He that was sinless became sin for us. That was unfair. There's four things we want to look at today in this question here of what to do when we suffer persecution. What's the way to respond? The proper way, the biblical and the Christ-like way. Number one, do what is right and good. Look at the verse 13 and 14 here, 1 Peter chapter 3 again. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? And they, these people that he was writing to were suffering. And he's saying, who, who can really hurt you if you are doing the right thing, doing good? But, and if, he says, you suffer for righteousness' sake. Look what he says. Happy, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror Neither be troubled. No, they're not, not going to be scared of this or afraid of what they can do to you. Somebody stuck a gun, and I think it was John R. Rice's stomach one day, and, and like a holdup, you know, and he said, you can't scare me with heaven. That's what he told the guy. Now, I don't know if I would have said that when somebody stuck a gun in my belly. I might have passed out. But you can't scare me with heaven. But he says, if you suffer for doing good, righteousness' sake, you should be happy. You're not, you're not suffering for doing wrong. Because if you do wrong, you deserve to suffer. But when you're suffering for righteousness' sake, happy are, are ye. And then in the beginning there, verse 13, he says, if ye be followers of that which is good, the answer to persecution is just continue to do right, continue to do good things. It says, be a follower of that which is good. The word follower, listen to this now, means the word they get from that in the original language is the, a zealot. <laughs> a believer is to be, in other words, so zealous to do right and do good that you become known for that. <laughs> be, being gripped with a passion and a zeal for good, you known as a zealot. <laughs> That's the challenge of the, of the passage here. Several things, uh, and there's several attitudes out in the world today, especially about doing good. Some people have a careless attitude towards goodness. They do what's right and what's good, and they have little conscience about right or wrong. They, they do whatever they feel like doing. They could care less if somebody else does right and wrong. It's good to do good. I understand that, they'll say, but occasionally I'm um, not always good, and it doesn't bother them. They have a careless attitude either way. Not, not a good place to be. Second, a selfish attitude towards goodness. If it benefits them to do good, I'll do it. If it helps me get some place at my job or whatever position I'm seeking, I will do good. But if it costs me something to do good, well, forget about that. I'm not doing that. So careless, selfish, third, a sentimental, surface kind of an attitude. 
They profess to believe in what's good and right and want to be morally right, but behind the scenes when no one's watching, they do whatever they want. <laughs> Not good either. Last, some people are, have a zealous attitude towards what's right. They're committed. I'm going to do what God's Word says. I'm going to live according to the Scriptures. I'm going to be doers of the Word. This is what it's saying here. Be a zealot. Be a fanatic when it comes to Christ. Be, be passionate and follow after that which is good and right. That's where we should all be on that fourth group. Amen? The believer who does good, he's saying here in verse 13, will, will less likely. Now, I know we're in the last days when, when people feel like those that are doing good, it's like we're the problem in this world and they want to get rid of us. But, but most of the time, if people know you're a good person, you're doing good, you're helping people, you're, you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, you, you live to do good and to follow them. You're not saved by doing good, but you want to do good. People will appreciate that. Your neighbors will appreciate that, all right? Uh, doing good will keep you from getting in trouble with the law with the authorities, with your neighbors, with fellow workers in the community. And so the chance of being persecuted for doing good is less likely. Again, that may change in these last days. The believer who suffers persecution, he's saying here as well, will be happy. That means God will, will bless you. You'll be blessed of God. And so the mind and the life of a true Christian, is you're focused on Christ and obeying his commands and you're obeying the word of God. And so no matter what you are being persecuted for, suffering for, you know Christ. You know that he's working all things together for good. We have that promise, right? Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together to good for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we have all these things as believers that we know if we do suffer, even for doing good, that we're not going to just, you know, wow, well, I don't know about this persecution and suffering. I may not be doing good anymore because I can't handle it. No, no. We're going to learn that it's okay, and this is what happens in this world, and we have the Lord on our side, and he works all things together for good. What if, what if Joseph said that? Well, look, my brothers wanted to kill me. Uh, now I'm a prisoner here. The wife of Potiphar is accusing me of having a, a, being after her. It's not true. He's thrown into prison. He could have said, forget it. It's not worth it. No, no. That was all part of God's plan to save the nation of Israel, as you remember, at the end. So you never know through persecution what God uh, can use that for. So we're going to say we're going to say God's going to work it together for good. The person that is persecuted for doing good also knows God will provide everything we need in life. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. A lot of times we leave out the next three words. And his righteousness. <laughs> We're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, uh, holy living. And then he says, all these things will be added unto you. Because remember, they were complaining about the material things of the world. He says, no, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things, in other words, that are really in the scheme of eternity, not important. They'll be taken care of. You'll be taken care of. A person that's persecuted for doing good knows the Lord will use your suffering as a testimony for Christ, and even touch, we hope, the hearts of the persecutor, the one that's persecuting you. God can use, imagine, his persecution of you and you handling it the right way to soften his heart. Deuteronomy 31.6, Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of a good courage, fear not nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That gives you strength and courage, knowing God's right there with you. Amen. Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord campeth and campeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. Isaiah 41, 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So God will use suffering, and then most of these verses, the three I just read, his presence, he's with us. How can we fear, <laughs> knowing we have God on our side? If God be with us, who can be against us? You know the answer to that. Number two, what else to do? Set your heart on Christ. 
Set your heart on Christ and the great hope He gives. Look at verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. How to do that? With meekness and fear. The second answer to persecution. Set your heart upon Christ and the great hope He gives to believers. We trust Christ, we're saved, we're born again, we're sanctified, set apart to serve the Lord. If Christ is in your heart, if you're saved, He is, and His Holy Spirit lives in your body temple, He strengthens you, He, he arouses in, in your inner man in, in the spiritual life. When you're saved, you have a new nature. We have that spiritual nature, not the fleshly nature, but this new nature. And you want to please the Lord. And when persecution comes, we can stand strong knowing, again, as we said in the first number one here, he's with us. He, he's there with us. Who should we fear? No one, again, we fear God and God alone. The fear of God relieves all lesser fears. And the true believer should and does and hopefully does please Christ. We wouldn't think of buckling under pressure or persecution and denying him. How many our early believers in the early New Testament church were martyred, even in our country, yeah, even in the, the new land as people came to seek religious freedom from persecution in Europe and other parts of the world, came to America originally for religious freedom. One of the foundations of our Constitution and Bill of Rights was religious freedom because the people that came initially to our country were suffering persecution at the hands of the church, Church of England and others. They were forced to have a religion that maybe they didn't want or believe in and they came here and they had freedom to choose whatever they wanted and hopefully we still have that, amen? We have freedom of speech, I, I think. We still have that? Is that still in there? <laughs> We have the right to bear arms. A lot of these things, I don't know about if you're watching the news, they're under attack. Our Constitution and our rights as, as Americans, as free, we thought we were free, right? It's under attack, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. We must stand up for these things, especially this one. And so persecution is nothing new to believers. When they, America was formed, uh, things have been going really good for the last couple hundred plus years. But who are we to think that persecution would, would always be peace and there would always be tranquility and there would always be freedom in our land? And it was going good for a while. <laughs> but the devil wants to destroy any hope of us thinking, you know, we know if you're saved. We don't think we know we have freedom in Christ. But these things, we must, as uh, the Bible says in Jude, contend. We earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered. And this is nothing new in America. This is a, a biblical truth about the freedoms we have in Christ. But contend for it and lovingly. He says, how do you do that? With meekness and fear, not with strength and boldness. Galatians 2.20 says this. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless... I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen to James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. That's trials, sufferings, persecution. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised Excuse me, to them that love him. Suffering persecution, if you're not, you will be at some point in your life. You may, you may have in the past, and you may be now presently, but if you haven't, you will in the future. How to handle it? Well, he tells us here in 1 Peter chapter 3. The third point is be ready to give an answer and defend the hope of your salvation. Look at verse 15 once again. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and in fear. The third answer to persecution is a ready answer to defend salvation to any man, any person, any woman. 
but do it with meekness and fear. That word answer there, and this is where we get the word today. You'll hear, I'm doing a course on apologetics, right? How to answer people about your faith. So that's that, that word answer is the Greek word apologia. It's to answer back, not, not in a bad way. You know how to say that kid answered back his mom over there. He needs a little one of these. No, <laughs> it means to answer respectfully and to give a defense of why you believe what you believe. Um, so suppose you don't agree with someone on a certain thing, whether the person's right and wrong or you're right or wrong. We have a right to our opinions, I think, don't we? <laughs> Do you know that people are dying in our military for the right, for us to have the right to believe whatever we want to believe, like religiously? If there are people that want to start their own religion and start worshiping, they have the right to do anything they want. And people are fighting for that, is what I'm saying. Because we have rights and we've, we've wanted that as Americans to have the freedom to choose to do that, even if it's wrong. Even if it's wrong, and we know that there are a lot of that, most are wrong, but that's what freedom does. <laughs> you have the right to be right, you have the right to be wrong, but you have the right. But you have a right to give an answer to your faith, whether someone believes what you're believing in or not. And you have uh, the ability, when you're being persecuted, to answer every man. Boy, you have a faith that I can't understand, well, let me tell you about it. You're going to apologia. You're going to answer them. First, you're to answer every man who asks you about salvation. They shouldn't even have to ask you. We should be looking and seeking for people that want that. You know, everybody needs to be saved, but every, not everybody wants to be. We, we know when we talk to people about, well, I don't talk about two things, religion and politics, right? But you know they need to be saved. You don't want to see your your mom and dad, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your nieces. Your, we don't want them to go to hell. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. None, none should perish. But you know what I'm talking about. You, you are concerned, and you should be because you're a believer. You don't want your loved ones and friends and loved ones to go to hell. So you're looking, and you're trying, and you're bringing up things to talk about maybe so it'll point to that. Sometimes they'll just ask you right out like the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? That doesn't always happen. That's the exception, not the rule. But you're ready. In other words, when something does happen and you have an opportunity to give that answer, he says, be ready. In other words, know the Bible. Know the Scriptures. Sometimes it's not always the, uh, the Romans road that you, that's your first, you know. Sometimes it's just to give them comforting words. Sometimes it's to be there for someone. Sometimes it's to pray with someone that's hurting. Sometimes it's to give a meal to someone that needs something. And then the door opens up to give the Roman road or the gospel plan of salvation. You know what I'm saying? But you're ready to give an answer to your friends, your employers, your employees, your classmates, a stranger maybe that you meet somewhere and you, know, you never know these divine appointments, we like to call them, where you just happen to run into someone and they have a need and you're able to help them, and next thing you know, you're praying with them the sinner's prayer that they can pray and be saved. You, don't, you never know. Don't miss any opportunity, I, I pray. I know that there have been times when I had an opportunity to say something. You may say, I did that too. There was an opportunity there, maybe a moment to, to sneak in, not sneak in, you know what I'm saying, to, to speak up for Christ. And you know, it, it, those moments sometimes come and go. And whenever they come up, I've missed many in the past, and I said, boy, next time that ever happens, I'm going to be, be ready. To, I should have been ready. But maybe I was embarrassed. I hate to say that. Maybe someone else was there, and I felt funny in front of that person. Whatever the reason, it was, it's not a good one. I, I should have said something. Have you ever had that happen to you? I'm sure you did. What do you do? Well, make up for it the next time. Be ready always to give an answer, apologia, to people out there that are looking for that hope that you have, that they need, but they don't even know they need. But you know they need it, and God knows. Be careful how you answer. How do you answer here? He says with a spirit of uh, meekness and fear. It means a tender, soft, caring, loving, humble, 
answer. When I got saved, I went to the friend of mine who I uh, was my best man my wedding, played football in college with me, like best friends from Jersey City. And I told him, I trusted Christ. Like me and my wife Margaret at the time, we got saved. And he said, oh, I'm a Christian, you know. <laughs> you know what I said? Well, you are? Why didn't you ever say anything to me? You know, we were best friends. You know what he said the answer was? And it was a good answer. In his eyes, it was right. He said, because I wasn't living as a Christian. You know, I was doing bad things. I wasn't. He said, I was a poor testimony. And he was. But... <laughs> I said, I would have went to hell, maybe, you know, and you, you didn't tell me about the Lord, and he apologized and everything, we were still friends, but meekness, and he was a very, <laughs> how could I say this in a nice way, he was a cocky, bold, proud kind of a guy, and that's not the way, that's like the opposite of how we're to be, and so when you approach people, you're not approaching them as Hey, listen, I'm a Christian. I know it all. No, that's the, they're for sure never going to listen. Meekness, not weakness, all right? Meekness. Christ was strong. He was a man, but he was meek in the sense that uh, he never forced himself on people or uh, was in a way rude, you know, and, and uh, overpowering. Meekness and fear, fear of the Lord, amen, the fear of God. To hold God with such reverence and awe that you're in a constant state of prayer and, and readiness. In other words, you're ready to give an answer because you're depending on Him. A lot of times, it wasn't me, I know, God will arrange, if you're ready, to, for people to meet up with you. Again, divine appointments. Because He knows you're ready. God knows you're ready. And He'll send people your way that are ready to hear the gospel even. And that's really when it works out good, when he makes these matches for you to then present the gospel. A man who wrote a book on First Peter's name is Alan Stibbs. And he said this about what we were just talking about. He said, we have some practical guidance concerning a Christian witness here in these verses. It's wrong sometimes to always be preaching at people. <laughs> Somebody said, you don't hear anybody preaching about hell anymore. Well, it's hard to go out in the streets of the city and tell people. I have a friend of mine right now. He's in Nepal. Went to school in Crown College. And he uh, lives there and he preaches to the, to the Hindus. And they'd stone him and spit at him, beat him up, all kinds of things. He's <laughs> but he goes out there and just tells people, you know, you're going to go to hell! You know, <laughs> and preaches on top of a, of a high place so that people are down, they can hear him in the crowd, and they don't like what he says, they attack him, the whole crowd, you know, and he's been left sometimes for dead, but he's not. He went to New Jersey, because that's where he's originally from, like me, he was preaching in front of the uh, abortion centers, and they've arrested him several times, he had to go to court, and he's always managed to, to get off, but sometimes the best approach <laughs> is not always is the rough, what we think of as the direct means when you're dealing with, with people. This writer, Alan Stibb, says the Christian wife was encouraged by Peter to win her unbelieving husband without even speaking on the subject. Right? He says to live your life, your conversation, remember the word conversation, that by her conversation, her, in other words, how she lives, she could win her husband. Well, of course, the husband would know something's different. But the whole situation has changed if a person asks. So you're giving an answer to those that have asked you of the hope within you. And the Christians are on the alert and your readiness is right. You can discern the question or some comment. And then when it's time to speak, one can do so only if one seeking is ready. We like to say that they are ripe for the picking, right? The Christian is then to engage, not in an aggressive attack on the other person's will, but in a logical account, a reasoned explanation of the hope that is in him. <laughs> the last words of Christ on this earth are the Great Commission, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it's given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts chapter 1, before he ascended, he said, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and that happened 
on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast, right? He told them, and then, he says, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, where they were, and that means right here, right in this area, Judea, the surrounding region, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And then the last point here in this uh, scripture here in 1 Peter 3 is keep a clear conscience, have a good conscience. Look at verse 16 and 17. How to respond to suffering for righteousness, persecuted for doing good, have a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And he finish, finishes with this. For it's better if, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It's better to suffer for doing good, in other words, than for suffer for doing evil. It should never be said about a Christian. He suffered for doing evil. Well, he deserved it then. God's saying, no, it's God's will when you suffer you suffer for well-doing. The, for, the fourth and final answer here to persecution, how to respond, is keep a clear conscience. A good conscience, he says. And because of your good conversation or conduct, he says that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your what? Your good conversation. Remember we said that word, conversation, your conduct, your behavior, your lifestyle. The only way a person can have a clear conscience is to have a good conduct. <laughs> if the believer is to stand against persecution, you have to have a good conduct, a good lifestyle. You know, you can't be a, a hypocrite here. To have a clear conscience, you have a good life, a good lifestyle. You're living as a Christian should live. Your conduct must be holy, righteous, pure, decent, upright, and above reproach. They call that blameless. That's one of the qualifications of an elder, that no one can have anything stick to you that, that you're accused of. It doesn't stick. Two things here will be done. First, those who oppose and persecute you, he says here in these verses, they'll be put to shame. How? Because of your good life, your good conscience, your clear conscience, your good behavior. People, will, people are always going to persecute believers. That, that's not going to change. But if you're really living for Christ... Your righteousness, your selflessness will convict those, should convict those, I should say, that love this world and the pleasures of this world. Eventually, they will be put to shame. That's what it says. <laughs> the good and righteous behavior of a believer will vindicate the believer either in this world or maybe in the world to come, but it will be done. The persecutor will stand ashamed of his attacks against the believer, and the idea is that he will be eternally ashamed. You know why? Because he'll be eternally separated from God in hell. Second, it's better for believers to suffer for doing good, he says, than for doing evil. Well, it's just common sense. A person can bear it and handle persecution better when he knows he's suffering for doing good than if he did something wrong, and he's saying to himself, well, you know, I really, I really deserved it anyway. It's difficult to stand up under persecution when it, because you did something wrong. So, you know what it says here? It says it's the will of God for believers to suffer and to bear up for doing good. God wants us to live holy lives. We're commanded, be ye holy. Why? God says, because I'm holy, God says. And so it's the will of God for believers to have a good conscience in spite of persecution. And oh, if you're living godly in Christ Jesus... Expect it. Don't be shocked. <laughs> James says, don't be shocked that you have to go through persecution and through many diverse trials and temptations in this life. 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul's talking to a young man, Timothy, <laughs> that many people believe was like his son in Christ and led him to Christ and, of course, sort of trained him. He was his mentor. He said this, Timothy, listen, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. How? In word, in conversation, or is in your lifestyle, in charity, in love, that means, in spirit, in faith, in purity. There are going to be people out there that may despise your youth, but he says, don't let them. Here's how you do it. Live this way. 
be an example. Pretty much what Peter's saying here. James 3.13. James 3.13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? <laughs> Where is he? Well, he says, let him show out of a good conversation, a good behavior, his works. Let him show it with meekness of wisdom. That's a wise man. And then 1 Peter 2.12, which we've covered prior to this. 1 Peter 2.12 says, Having your conversation, your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, your good conversation, your honest behavior, which they shall behold, they'll see it, glorify God in the day of visitation. <laughs> When it may be too late for them, they're going to they're gonna see someday that you were right, they were wrong, and it'll be too late for them in the day of visitation. Listen, God has allowed, God allowed his son, God allowed himself to go to the cross because he so loved the world. And don't think he's not going to allow us to suffer sometimes as well, but suffer for doing right, not for doing wrong. Hey, if I go to prison... Because I was preaching the gospel, I expect you folks to pray for me, bring me that loaf of bread, you know, with that saw blade in there. <laughs> no, I'm serious. But if I go to prison because I did something wrong, hey, I deserve to be there. I still want you to pray for me, though. <laughs> but I, I would feel very poorly if I did something like that. But when we take a stand for the Lord, you can be sure <laughs> the forces of evil are against us. The world system is against us. The devil is against us. Evil people in powerful places are against us. But the Lord is for us. Amen. And that's what a lot of the verses we quoted in this message. The presence of God, His Holy Spirit in our body temple, the promises of God of a future eternity with Him in heaven, all these things make any suffering or any persecution we may go through in this world nothing compared to the glory. Amen. And the life that we'll have for all eternity with God in heaven. And you have to look at all these things. And I hope you're not going through persecution, but if you are, we have these promises and these examples here. Many that went before us that have suffered uh, to the point of death for their faith in Christ. The first martyr in the Bible uh, was stoned for his faith. And look what happened to that Paul who was Saul of Tarsus, witnessed that and became one of the greatest Christians, wrote most of the New Testament, I think 75% of the New Testament written by Paul. And so uh, God uses persecution in our lives to make us stronger in other people's lives that are watching how, people watch how you handle adversity. And it may lead to someday them saying to you, boy, I've been noticing you, you've been going through a tough time and how you're handling it, and then it opens the door for you to witness to them. Amen? And I know it's happened to some of you already, and hopefully it happens more. Like God uses that for His glory. Amen? That's what it's all about. Well, let's pray, and uh, thank you for your prayers for me and for the others uh, today. Let's ask the Lord to help us here today to take a stand for Him, and these are four ways of how to do that. Father, we thank you for your Word. For this time today, we've already had together in Sunday school and morning worship and look forward to hearing from you again this evening, Psalm 76. Our Lord, bless this uh, song that we're going to sing, this moment of uh, contemplation and, and uh, thinking about what we've heard from you. Lord, uh, help us when we do suffer persecution to handle it properly, Lord, to know that you're with us and to see it as an opportunity to witness to others for Christ. Lord, bless the rest of our time here the few minutes we have together, and then, of course, this evening again as we meet. We thank you for this place, for this church, for these people, and, Lord, mostly for you, a presence in our lives to help us through any of these difficult times that we may encounter. Lord, bless this time now. May it glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks.